Hello everybody, this is Dr. Cole. It's Sunday afternoon, October 23rd. And we're now entering week two of Pluto Science 1013 for the fall 2022 term on the second eight week schedule. Everybody, we have our first exam coming up Saturday the 29th. Uh, you have not quite a week to work on getting ready. There'll be 50 items on the exam, uh, mostly true false, some multiple choice based on your class notes for units one and two of the course, plus four readings to be accessed online to which I've sent you links. And we'll say a little bit more about all that in a moment. Okay, uh, So you can take it anytime. You have a 24 hour window to take it on Saturday the 29th. Once you begin, you have 45 minutes to complete the exam. Okay? So, uh, well, that will be coming up Saturday the 29th. Now, we talked about Unit 1 last week. Unit 1 was on political participation and to a large extent elections. To finish up the material for the exam, we have Unit 2 on parties and pressure groups. So let me say just a word for a few minutes about what we try to cover in Unit 2. We talk about parties as organizations that try to elect people to public office and get control of the government. Okay. There are many functions that parties fill, and we go through some of those. But the most important thing, perhaps, is to nominate candidates for office who will win office and thereby win control to some degree or another of the government. You know, as we talk about three aspects of the party, the party is a three-headed giant. There's the party in the electorate, the voters who regard themselves as Democrats or Republicans, the party in government, people who got elected as either Republicans or Democrats, and then the party organization, the Democratic and Republican National Committees and their affiliate organizations at the state and local level. Okay. The, the party in the electorate, the party in government, and the party organization. Okay. Now, we go through the organization of the parties, we talk about the National Party Chairs. We emphasize that it's a very loose organization that sort of parallels the organization of the federal system we have in the United States with national, state, and local government. Now, we spend a com considerable amount of time addressing why there are only two major parties, the two-party system. And what it comes down to is the rules of the game that we have made here in the United States of America. They give an advantage to the two biggest parties and make it very difficult for any kind of third party to get started. Okay, so pay very close attention to that discussion of why there are only two parties. We discuss countries with different rules of the game where many more than two political parties have popped up. And we uh, discuss that to some extent. We talk a fair amount about the history of the two parties going back not quite a century or so. We mentioned that the two parties took on the character that they have now, largely during the time of Franklin D. Roosevelt before and during World War II. And they retain that character to some extent even today, even though they've gone through lots of twists and turns in the meantime. In fact, there are some fairly dramatic changes that have taken place uh, with regard to the two political parties. Uh, during the 21st century, extended back to the very end of the 20th century, before the lifetimes of some of you, I suppose. So take a look at that closely. We talk about the character of the two parties, the kinds of people who support each one, and how that has changed uh, since Franklin D. Roosevelt's day. All right? Now, along with parties, there are pressure groups, also organizations that try to influence the government, but generally not by running candidates for public office. Instead, you might say they try to influence things by working behind the scenes. And there may be hundreds or thousands of pressure groups as opposed to only two parties, uh, depending on who's counting. It's hard to get a grip on exactly how many pressure groups there are because practically any organization can act as a pressure group. Most, but not all of them, are working on behalf of the economic interests of their members. They, represents, they represent products made or services provided in the economy, or people working in various occupations and professions. Okay, some are big, some are smaller and quite narrow. We go through uh, 
uh, somewhat of a listing and a categorization of the different pressure groups in different categories. Okay. Some of which are big, some of which are small. We try to mention some of the larger, more prominent ones that you may have heard of. Okay. Now, pressure groups are often accused of being corrupt. They're sometimes seen as a corrupting influence because they give out money. They contribute, make campaign contributions to people running for office. But lobbyists would say that an important part of their job is to provide accurate information to the people they're working with. So you will read about the different kinds of pressure groups and the kind of activities they engage in, especially the activity known as lobbying or directly contacting public officials, which anybody could do, but some of that activity is carried on by professional lobbyists who represent and work for pressure groups. All right, that takes care then of the material for the exam. The notes for units one and two but then there are also the four articles we have assigned you. Let me say just a word about those. One is called Americans Aren't Practicing Democracy Anymore, or words to that effect. Look closely at that. The author, Mr. Applebaum, discusses what schools might be able to do about that. But it doesn't involve taking more courses having to do with politics. It's a little different angle on that that he takes. Then there's an article by Mr. Ronald Brownstein, Why Politics Has Become So Stressful. Okay. Now we have a major election coming up in November, November 8th, and many people, shall we say, are freaked out about it. Okay. If you go to the very end of the course and look at the notes I posted for the last unit, Unit 8, I mentioned that things may be happening that may cause professors to throw out a good bit of the things they've been saying in political science 101 type courses like this one down through the years. Uh, so we'll be trying to address that as we go through the course. You may have noticed there's some things I've added about things that have happened very recently in the notes for units one and two that try to address what has been going on, uh, especially since the election of 2020 and the events of January 6th, 2021. Okay. Now, what Mr. Brownstein says is that it doesn't seem as though there are very many people open to persuasion anymore. The electorate is divided about half and half into two hostile camps. And very few people in those camps are willing to cross party lines. There's a handful of so-called swing voters, a very small part of the electorate that might go one way or the other. And so what they do is going to determine the outcome. On top of all that, people perceive that the stakes of the election has become very high to the extent that perhaps they can barely abide it if the other side wins, which may explain quite a bit of what we've been going through in the country in our political system over the past couple of years. You have an article by Mr. David French describing the influence of religion on the system. Okay. To some extent, our political divide in the country has become religious versus secular. And that poses some very major serious problems, shall we say. And Mr. French discusses how that dimension of politics is impacting uh, the political system. Finally, we have an article by Mr. Matthew Continenti uh, about Donald Trump and the hold that Donald Trump continues to exercise over the Republican Party. So those are four articles for you to read for the exam. Expect 10 or 15 items on the exam on those four articles. And the remainder of the 50 items will come from the class notes for units one and two. Okay, so that's the exam that we will take. Saturday the 29th, you have a 24-hour window in which to take it. Once you begin, you have 45 minutes to complete the exam. There'll be a combination of multiple choice and true-false, mostly true-false, mostly coming from the class notes for units one and two, but also expect some on those four articles I just mentioned we sent you links to those four articles in the announcement we sent out for the reading assignment for exam one. So that will take place Saturday. Okay. Contact me with any questions, problems, or issues. You can contact me through the course website or at uh, david.cole at opsu.edu. So we wish you good luck on the exam. Uh, and once the exam is over, uh, in about a week from now this time, we'll be talking to you once again about what we're going to be laying out for exam two, the midterm exam. Remember, it's just an eight-week course, so we have exams coming rapid fire every two weeks. But good luck on exam one. 
Study hard and take it easy, and we'll talk to you once again once the exam is over, about a week from now at this time.